Well, praise the Lord. I'm so excited to be in these buildings. I hope you are. Oh, it brings back so many memories of things that the Lord has done. We've seen him do over the years. And it, it, I'll be honest, if it were just half this building, I'd still be leaping and jumping and praising God. Uh, because if you could just get half this building, you'd have a miracle, amen. And uh, it reminded me of um, when many years ago, I pastored a church for 40 years. And we inherited the worst site in Reading. It had a ramshackle house on the front, which was grade two listed. It has 60,000 pounds worth of liability on it. And there was an acre of land and God turned it all around. And when we left after 40 years, uh, we'd been, had two and a half rebuilds and buildings worth three quarters of a million pounds. That was God, because we had nothing and we saw God do wonderful, wonderful miracles. And it's just stirred me to be here uh, and to see all this. I mean, this is, this is astonishing and incredible. So um, I want to stir you this afternoon. I've already had an answer to prayer. I was saying, Lord, please move someone to put some water up there. <laughs> and, and there's two parts to this, because not only did I get my prayer answered, but our sister gets a reward, because the scripture says that even if you give someone a cup of water in my name, you shall in no wise lose your reward. So you've added something into your reward when we go to meet with the Lord. That's good news, isn't it? Amen. Thank you for the testimony and also the, um, uh, the um, uh, little um, exhortation uh, that uh, Jason gave. I'm going to take my jacket off. Wigglesworth used to say, you can't preach or work with a jacket on. Amen. So we lay aside every weight and the thing which doth so easily beset us. And we look with patience unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And where is he now? He sat down at the right hand of God. He's seated at the majesty on high, far above all principalities and powers. Let me tell you, God does not have problems, only solutions. That's good news, isn't it? And so whatever your problems are, God can solve them. Amen. And I was thinking as Jason shared, um, you know, the, the little exhortation. I'm going to challenge you today. I'm just the postman. I haven't come to give you anything apart from what, what the postmaster general has given me to bring to you. So don't shoot the messenger, <laughs> but go back to the person who sent the message. Uh, and if you want to stone me, you can do that. I don't mind. I've been stoned many times, not literally. But uh, carpenter from Nazareth requires joiners. Carpenter from Nazareth requires joiners in this place. You know, um, I have got a message, it's going to be in two parts, but I just want to um, share one or two things with you. Just a few quotes. Let me give you a few quotes before we start. We shall have all eternity to celebrate our victories, but we have only one short hour before the sunset in which to win them. Amen? That's true. That's absolutely true. And you're part of the problem until you become part of the solution. And God's got some things here that he wants you to be involved in. And I'm just sharing these with you. I collect these little quotes and people remember them more than the message. Half a dozen men on their knees for 60 minutes waiting upon the Lord with the absolute conviction that they have no answer, that their human ideas and programs are ineffective and bankrupt, they will accomplish more than 50 men around the table discussing problems for a whole year. Amen. Maybe some of you have seen that. Uh, there was um, uh, uh, another one. Uh, I'll just find this. There was one that was really, really, really on my heart. If I can just dig this one out and this has been on my spirit um, let's see if we can find it well here's a challenge for you 1903 one man with 17 followers began his attack on the world Do you know what his name was Lenin and 15 years later the 17 had multiplied into 40,000 disciples and at its demise communism controlled or influenced over half of, of the world's population that is the truth. 
And Jesus started with 12 disciples, added nothing. They became 120 and they turned the world upside down. And now this quote I'm looking for, I don't know whether I can find it here. It's here somewhere. Anyway, I'll just try and quote it. I can't just lay my finger on it. But we have all eternity to celebrate our victories, but only one short hour on earth in which to win them. Amen. So with that in mind, let's, uh, we'll pray together and we'll take our Bibles. I'm going to read you a reading, but let's just pray together. Father, we thank you for bringing us here together today. We thank you that every time we come together, it's a divine appointment. You've got something to say to us, Lord. And your word says, let he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. So we pray this afternoon, speak to our hearts, O God. Challenge us, convict us, motivate us, empower us, Lord. I pray that you'll release faith into this congregation. Release the gift of faith, O God, over this congregation and over this church. Lord, lift away from us all doubt and unbelief, all apathy, all lethargy, all inertia, everything that would hold us back, Lord. And we pray that we'd be motivated by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hide the preacher, Lord, and let us just hear your word uh, this afternoon, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, please just uh, take your Bible, if you've got it there, and I'm going to um, read to you. And... um, I did have a message, but I, I've actually altered it slightly. It's good to do that sometimes. You know, we can plan something, and the Lord says, not quite right direction. And so um, the, the message I gave to Jason was preparing for final examinations. But I'm changing it a little bit, was uh, um, uh, uh, preparing for final results. Because in the education system, particularly with COVID, they couldn't take the exam, so they based it on what they had done through the two years' work and so on. And that's a different thing, and that's exactly what the Christian life is like. And so um, my message really is, is preparing for final results. If you have a Bible, I'm going to give you two readings. We're going to go into the Old Testament, first of all. Nothing old about it, it's very up-to-date and living. And of course the New Testament writers only had the Old Testament, that's what they preached from. And they had the the kerygma, the spoken word. And uh, so we're going to the book of Haggai, the book of Haggai. And we've just been down uh, doing a meeting down in, um, where have we been Mary, Ipswich, just outside Ipswich there. And I was praying, Lord, what do you want me to bring to this church here today? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me so clearly from the book of Haggai. I'm going to read the chapter and then I'm going to share with you the exact words that he gave me. And over 40 years, we've lived by faith. We've seen miracles, wonderful things happen, been to many parts of the world. I can tell you wonderful stories that the promises of God are wonderful. You cannot break God's promises by leaning on them. But you can change history, you can change, see your life changed by promises from the word of God. And I believe the key to the Christian life is allowing the Holy Spirit to take the appropriate promises that we need for our lives and congregation, embracing them, acting upon them, believing them, confessing them and letting God work them out. The Spirit wants to give promises And he has exceeding great and precious promises that he wants to give us. So we'll read Haggai 1, first of all, and then I'll take you to a New Testament, um, uh, a couple of readings there. And what I'm going to share today is, uh, the first half, it's a a double-barreled message, Old and New Testament. The, The first barrel comes from Haggai, and the second barrel comes from things that we have to do now to be ready for when we go to be with the Lord. Uh, That is called the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema. And after the Lord takes his true church to be with him and we are raptured, there is an exam board that is waiting there to see how we got on. And I'm going to share with you some of the things that that exam board will be looking for, which we have done whilst here on planet Earth walking with God. But let's read Haggai chapter 1. Haggai. I don't know whether any of you have ever read the book of Haggai, but in in the Old Testament, 
um, uh, there's two particular prophets who operated very much in tandem time-wise. One is Haggai and the other is Zachari uh, Zechariah. And uh, there are two books in the Old Testament that very much run in tandem. One is the book of Ezra and the other is the book of Nehemiah. Someone said ne he Nehemiah is the shortest man in the Bible. That's just my humour. <laughs> but uh, anyway, they run together and they are restoration books and restoration writers. And through history, not the least through the Bible, God is a God of restoration. There are seasons when he does things and says things. He restores his people. He breaks into history and he does something fresh and new and he uses ordinary people like you and me to fulfill his purposes. That's all he uses. And God can use anybody just because we bring something from God doesn't make us particularly good because remember God spoke through an ass when he was with Balaam. And if God can speak through an ass, God can speak through any one of us and to any one of us. And he's no respecter of persons. And God has used, used the foolish things of the world to confound the wise that no flesh should glory in his presence. So th these are restoration books. And, the, and I believe God spoke to me and said, I want you to bring to born evangelical, particularly Haggai chapter 1. And I'm going to emphasise a particular verse here in a moment. Let's read it together. And you remember that uh, after uh, the days of King Solomon, uh, the kingdom was divided, the northern kingdom into ten tribes, the southern kingdom into two tribes, and the northern kingdom went into captivity in 722 BC, the northern kingdom in 586. The northern kingdom was scattered, and really not to be regathered, but the southern kingdom, after 70 years, was gathered back. And God had a remnant of people who he was going to use, and he brought a remnant back. And God always uses a remnant. Don't look for God in the big crowds. He's moving today through the remnant church. You're a remnant, we're a remnant where we are. And all over the nation there are remnants of people who believe in and trust and honour God's word in its entirety. And there are many religious people in the church who don't. That's the sad thing and that's, it's getting more and more divided. And so th these are our remnants. And so they come back and uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and Haggai and Zechariah are accounts of how the Lord used these different people to bring restoration. And it's very applicable to hear because I sense in my spirit something. You might not be excited about what God is doing, but just walking in this building and seeing it, I'm excited. I'm excited because I know other people where this is happening. One or two others in the country where they have a vision. So in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, notice all the dates. They have, dates are always very specific in God's word. Doesn't always happen straight away, but there are seasons when God moves. The word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Do you know God's people sometimes say that? I've had it in the church I've pastored. It's not time to rebuild. It's not time to have a new building. It's not time to do this and to do that. If only they knew what leaders go through in seeking God to find out what the right time is. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai, by the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O you, to dwell in your panelled or sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. And I'll try and address that a bit later on because I believe that finance and money is an integral part of our discipleship and how we use it and how we believe God should 
use money. I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel. I'm talking about honouring God through finance and money and believing. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, second time, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. You look for much and it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, said the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is waste and you run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground brings forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labour of the hands. These people, God had touched everything and brought fruitfulness to to, to a halt because of what was going on and will explain the keys as to why that was happening. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, please note. It's never just one or two men, it's always everybody flowing together. And the church is a body. It's not one person, it's a body. Church which is his body obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spoke Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people saying. So having rebuked them and told them to consider their ways then he comes and encourages them. Uh, And the Lord's message unto the people saying I am with you saith the Lord. Isn't that lovely? He gave them a little bit of a poke and then he said, but I want you to know I'm with you. I'm with you. If God is with you, who can be against you? If my presence go not with you, carry me not up hence. And the Lord said, my presence shall go with you. I'll give you rest. So if God's presence is there, which it is here today, then God is with us. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and notice the spirit of all the remnant of the people. It wasn't just the pastor or one or two elders or anyone else. Everybody was stirred. And they came and they did work in the house of the Lord of hosts their God. In the four and twentieth day, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. And then we go to the New Testament, uh, to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and these are some of the most solemn verses, read from 1 Corinthians 3, 11, for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ, no other way to be saved. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he has built thereupon, what's the result? He shall receive a reward. And it so happens that there are at least five beautiful rewards that you can receive and they could apply to one of them, at least to everybody within this church today. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And uh, later on in another place it says we must all stand before uh, the judgment seat of Christ. We'll just find that quickly, 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. So the rapture of the church, the judgment seat of Christ, where the results of our studies and our lives, not the exam itself, because we're doing that now, we're preparing like the teachers in the school uh, and they will, we will be assessed at the end. And, and 
I'm going to share with you for the second half uh, how that will be assessed because it's very interesting. And then the marriage supper of the Lamb and all of that in my view will take place whilst planet Earth is suffering a seven year period which is Daniel's 70th week, Daniel chapter 9 which is one of the most catastrophic periods that's ever come on planet Earth which Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24. And you know all the machinery is set up technologically and computer wise that a world, one world system could come in just like that right now. That, so how close is the rapture? How close is the final call before we're taken to be with Jesus? <clears throat> if you don't believe that, well, we give out tracks by Tony Pierce, who's an expert on prophecy. And it's all out there. One world system, globalisation. We're already seeing what vaccinations can do. I don't want to get into vaccine or not vaccine, but you can control people very quickly, as you know. Okay, so let's go back to Haggai, first of all. So there's a challenge and a prophetic word here in the Old Testament, and then a challenge from the New Testament uh, um, to... Uh, an appointment that every Christian will have to keep without exception and there are two restoration prophets and two restoration characters a remnant returned and the people complained now I don't know anybody here I don't know what, what you feel about what's going on here so you can't come and blame me afterwards <laughs> I don't know who's for it or who's against it I don't know what you say in your house but God does I don't know what you say in your private uh, closet. This people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. And then in verses 3 to 11, we have a message by God in response to that. And twice he says in verses 5 and 7, consider your ways, consider your ways. Now I've discovered over the years that the Lord is always asking us to consider our ways. Amen. There's never a time when we're not to consider our ways. Even if we're flowing in blessing, we still have to consider our ways. And then he gives encouragement. He gives encouragement. But um, the, the verse that really spoke to me, I was, just, I was sitting in the bedroom where we were uh, staying over the, from the last meeting. And it's like I, I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit speak into my spirit. This, all I'm sharing with you is what God said to me. And he said this, is it time for you to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? That's all he said. I can only pass on what the commander in chief told me to bring you. And you, maybe you're saying that. And you say, well, how does that apply? Well, we travel around to different places and I know many other people who do. And there's, there's a malaise upon the church today, right across this nation. It is one thing to have had COVID, and we all know all that's gone on on that, and of course there were restrictions and government embargoes and all the rest of it, but something has come out of COVID which I believe is distressing to the heart of God. And it is now that people just want to stay at home, hide behind a screen, and don't want to come out and worship with God's people and fulfill Hebrews 10.25 which says, not forsaking the assembling together of, uh, uh, of you as the manner of some is, but to exhort one another, and even more so as you see the day approaching. And I've discovered some people, I know, I know some will be on Zoom, some have valid reasons for not coming. Some are too far away. But I'm discovering that people are hiding behind Zoom. They don't show their face. They do ironing. They do eat breakfast. They do everything else. And all the sort of things that we wouldn't do if we were here together in holy assembly before God. I'm being honest with you, that's the problem. And I've spoken to others, uh, other ministers, some travel more than I do, and they all say the same thing. I know of one church where the numbers have increased, actually, believe it or not. And that's because some people joined because they left from another church which wasn't preaching uh, all, all the prophecy of the Bible. That's our brother Ian. But uh, this was the, the thing God had. Uh, and here, it, it, I believe this is the word that the Lord is saying. 
Is it time for you to dwell in your panelled houses, hiding behind Zoom, unless you really have to, <laughs> and not coming to be with God's people? And you know, when the apostles wrote, they wanted face-to-face -face fellowship. There's nothing to replace face-to-face -face fellowship. In their own fellowship, at the moment, those who come, there is an anointing of God's presence that comes upon those who are gathering together. And in one place, I think it was the Apostle John said, I, uh, I have many things to write unto you, but I long to see you face to face, that my joy might be full. And if that's true of humans, how much more of the living God who wants to come and meet with us and be with us. Thank God for modern technology, it served it serves a purpose, but there's nothing to replace face-to-face uh, -face fellowship and gathering together. And, and in case you're worried about it, uh, my Bible has Psalm 91, which promises protection uh, if we do what God wants us to do, not by being foolish, but Psalm 91 promises to keep us from plagues and all the rest of the things. Notwithstanding, I mean, we put masks on if we go in shops, you can, whatever level you've got faith for. But whatever you do, whether you do or don't vaccinate, it's what you do by faith that matters. Is it faith or is it fear? If you, if, if you don't take it, fine, but are you exercising faith? If you do, exercise faith and not fear, because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Okay, so the reason I, I believe the Lord drew me to this chapter today is because um, I, I get a sense uh, that God wants to do something in Bourne, something unique, to, to be, have the ability uh, to move into premises like this is a unique opportunity for God to do something in this locality. And God spoke to them. And he said to them, be strong and work. And whatever the past has been in a church, there is a, always a clarion call to move forward. Now you may feel, I mean, I think I've heard Jason say this, sometimes we haven't seen too much happen. Isn't that precisely what was said here? But God said, forget what's gone on in the past. I'm giving you an opportunity now to move forward. Now I know the church is of course people and it is not buildings but the Lord has provided buildings to serve the church and to serve the vision buildings are not the church but they serve his purpose and even in the Old Testament a temple served the purpose of God now we are the temple but here God speaks and in chapter 2 if you carry on through the message he, he says, um, Zerubbabel, who is left among you that saw this house in a first glory? And how do you see it now? Interesting question, isn't it? All over this country there are probably buildings like this which were birthed and grew in the presence and moving of the Holy Spirit in the late 19th century, some of them 18, some whatever, and many of them have declined. And we could say, who amongst you has seen uh, 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 this house in her first glory? How do you see it now? Many buildings, many places, just a few handful of people. And most of the churches, they finish up as flats or they finish up as warehouses. I think it's tragic. Where people sacrificially gave money and sites for the glory of God and there's nothing there. And then uh, he, the, the prophet here says, be strong all you people of the land, for I am with you. And then he reminds them uh, that when he covenanted with them when they came out of Egypt, that was a miracle. So my spirit remains among you, fear not. And then he speaks, uh, obviously prophetically to the future, but there's something present here, because these chapters and these verses were speaking of the rebuilding of a second temple after the Solomon of Temple. Solomon's temple, which of course replaced the tabernacle. And, and God has often used buildings right through history. I personally believe myself that when Jesus Christ returns and sets up his millennial kingdom in Jerusalem, I believe there'll be another temple there. 
which is described in Ezekiel 40 to 48. Are there reasons for that? We won't go into it. But the Lord here says, um, I will fill this house with glory. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts, and in this place will I give peace. Isn't that wonderful? Partly to be fulfilled through Haggai, but certainly to be fulfilled in the future. Because many prophecies have, have primary and secondary applications. Some, some are for now, some are for later. And I sense that God wants to, this, the glory of this house here to be greater than the former. And I believe he can do it. He only needs a few surrendered people. God doesn't need a lot of people. He just needs a few surrendered people and he can do something amazing. I often think of Gideon's army where the God reduced it from several thousand right down to just a few people and God fulfilled his purposes through just a few. God doesn't use lots of people, he uses a few, a few surrendered people. And so in chapter 2 and verse 3, there's the question, who saw this house in her former glory? And then he gives promises. And God reminds them in these chapters of his sovereign power. He takes them to the end of the age and reminds them that in a little while he's going to shake the heavens, the earth and the sea and everything. The God who can do that can certainly help rebuild the second temple. He can do a miracle. And so God reminds them of his sovereign power, even right through to, uh, to uh, the end of the chapters here and what he's going to do at the end of the age. There's a kind of uh, parallel here. And so uh, verses 21 and 22 are actually the, the future mixed with the present. And so there comes a point where although there hadn't been much fruit, there hadn't been much growth, and maybe you feel that could have been the case over the years, although you can, you can plod on carefully with a group of people committed, you might not have seen much fruit or growth. The Lord says there's a day come now uh, when it's going to alter. And in chapter 2 and verse 19, um, he says this, From this day will I bless you. There comes a point where God changes it all. And, and from that point, um, through the book of Haggai and Zechariah, and through Neo Ezra and Nehemiah, not only did they rebuild the city, but they rebuilt the second temple. Isn't that wonderful? So God's a God of restoration. And, and God can restore things. But restoration's a key theme in the Bible. I will restore unto you the years that the locusts have eaten. Can restore your life, restore your marriage, restore your church. Restore your finances when you've been bankrupted. We've just been with some people. And God restored them and blessed them. I don't know why that God allows that sometimes, but he does. And so God is a God of restoration. And so the first part of the message is this. Is it time for you to dwell in your panelled houses and this house lie waste? I believe that's the question the Lord asks us. Do you really want to see something happen? Now for me, I like action. I want to be where the action is. I want to be in the centre of what God is doing. Amen? That's all my prayer. It doesn't really matter. I want to see God move. I want to see God fulfil his promises. And the word of God says that what we do now is so important because we're building something now. We're building for eternity. And when Jesus Christ returns and we are raptured to be with him, and when we stand before that judgment seat of Christ, we've got to answer for all the things that we have done now in our work, witness, life and testimony up until that time. Once we get there, it'll be too late. So the time of the judgment seat of Christ, which is the Bemar throne, it's not the only judgment. If I were speaking on prophecy, there's seven of them. Um, this is just one of them. Seven different judgments. Let me tell you what they are. Judgment of your sins upon the cross. Thank God for that. None of us would be here without that. Our self-judgment through life. Do you know what that is? When we come together around the Lord's table, what are we supposed to do? Work out everyone else in the church who's done something wrong and point the finger. <laughs> we are to judge ourselves that we should not be judged. Our self-judgment through life. 
so that when communion comes, it's a reminder, it's a little check-up each time that we make sure that we're living right. Judgment of Israel for many centuries of rebellion, and that's very close to happening now. It's been happening. And all Israel shall be saved, but it'll be a remnant. Judgment of angels for rebellion against God. Number five, judgment of believers works before the millennium comes, the judgment seat of Christ. Judgment of living nations on the earth before Jesus sets up his millennial throne in Jerusalem. Please note replacement theology people and Islam and supersessionists because that's where he's coming. That's why there's all conflict. Satan knows if, you, if they don't know. And then the judgment of the wicked dead at the end of the millennium. Three different thrones, the Bema, uh, the throne of his glory for the living nations and the judgment of all those at the end of the millennium, the great white throne. It's white because it's pure. So the, the persons who are judged are only believers. We all must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The ground of that judgment is our life and labour and what we do now. We are weaving into that wedding garment something now that will come out when we get to that marriage. We shall look at that wedding garment and woven into it will be all the things that we have done. I don't want to stand there with nothing to show. I don't want to stand there before Jesus and, and not feel that I've done everything I can to serve him and to do what he wants me to do. And so the ground of judgment is our life and labour. Uh, the issue or result of that judgment is one of two things, either reward or loss. Either reward or loss. The severity of that judgment is fire. Because Revelation 1 says that Jesus, when John saw him, had feet of brass and eyes of burning fire. And he will look through me and look through you and he will look through everything that we have done. And only if it stands the test of fire and it is pure and its motives are right and it is led by the Holy Spirit will it stand the test. It's an awesome thought. Awesome thought. And the standard is what? It is our faithfulness. There's a parable Jesus taught, isn't there? Well done, you good and prosperous servant. No. Financial servant? No. Faithful servant? Yes. Well done now, good and faithful. And what God requires in stewards is that they be faithful. We all. And, and it will be revealed by fire. It will be revealed by fire. And he will burn up that which is not of God. And... Some people will just be saved as by fire. I think that's terrible. We want to stand with something. And these are possibilities that we must face. And the standard is our faithfulness. And it covers everything. The sum total of our life. The product of our development. Not only our deeds, but our possibilities. Not just our actions, but also our omissions. For he that does not do certain things, it is sin. Not just the work, but the worker. Not just what is attained, but what we strove after. All kinds of things that God will look for. And gold, silver or precious stones, gold is divine, isn't it? Silver is redemption. Precious stones or wood, hay or stubble. Easy to remember wood, hay and stubble. You know the, how to remember it? Wood. Hay and stubble. That's how you remember it. And it's, it's all stuff you shave off. It's no, really it doesn't do much good. Okay. So, so there are certain things there. And there are precious stones. Now what I'd like to do now, just very quickly, if I may, I don't know how we're doing on time. I don't want to keep you too long, give you indigestion. But I want to just give you a little list of certain areas in which God is interested for the judgment seat of Christ. May I do that? Certain areas in which he is interested. And these are things that are so important. And then if I tell you that there are five different crowns or rewards that you can get at the end, you'll know that it's worthwhile serving God. Amen? 
Five of them. Five fingers. Okay, let me just give you this little list. I won't go into them in huge detail. Maybe, um, uh, uh, maybe a pastor can unwrap some of these. Number one, how we treat other believers. Hebrews 6.10 God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labour of love, which you, which you have showed towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. We are called to minister and serve one another, amen? Not to please ourselves, but to serve one another. And if we could do that, that would change our whole shape of our life. Just a cup of water given receives a reward. Minister to me. And I believe in the church today that in many places there's a tremendous lack of love. Lack of love. We don't care for other people. We're more interested in ourselves and our own agendas. So how we treat other believers. <coughs> Jesus said in one place that he receive, that receiveth you receiveth me. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Well, he didn't. He was persecuting those who believed in Jesus. So how we treat other people is extremely important. How we love other people, how we lay down our lives for other people. And uh, 1 John 3.16, John 3.16 is the gospel, but 1 John 3.16, doesn't it say that we ought to lay down our lives one for another? That's real sacrificial Calvary love. How we treat other believers. Number two, how we exercise our authority over others. Be not many teachers, for they receive the greater condemnation. So if we have authority or position, we are to use it as servants, we are to use it in love. At, when I was at Three Mile Cross for 40 years, we were blessed to have some of the choicest saints of God that have ever walked the face of this earth. We had just about every well-known preacher you can imagine. And, and it was a miracle, really, how we got them. And we had one, um, one brother who came, and this man had been a millionaire and he gave it all up in the aviation industry. And God gave him a vision uh, to set up full gospel shortwave radio across the face of the earth to preach the gospel. And he set up a station in Lebanon called High Adventure. He set up one in Guam in the South Pacific, another one in, in South America. Uh, and because of the, I don't understand it, all the atmospherics, it was a perfect time for all that to happen. And he covered the face of the whole earth uh, with this um, shortwave radio. And I had the honour and privilege of sending out a message on the one from Lebanon, which went to 52 different countries. And they took one of our morning services and, and sent it out. And the message was, who touched me? <laughs> anyway, this man came to preach at our church. And I always watched to see what people do. And when we got to the end of the service, instead of being highfalutin, I heard him with my own voice say, where are these chairs that have got to be put back? And he was out there putting the chairs back and piling them up. That doesn't sound like a lot of preachers I know. He was there to serve. He was there to serve. How we exercise our authority over others. How we employ our God-given abilities. Let every man speak as the ability which God gives, 1 Peter 4.10. I think you mentioned it at the beginning. And you know, God gives us all abilities. You might say, well, what abilities have I got? We've all got abilities. We've all got something that we can offer. Some people have got more than others. Uh, Anna, in Luke's Gospel, served the Lord with fastings and prayers in her 80s. Amen. Nobody knew she did it and she'll get a greater reward than a lot of people who stand on platforms serving God. How we employ our God-given abilities. And in the parable of the talents, some were give, they were all given his abilities, but you're given them. Some had more than others. One had one and he went and hid it in the earth. He was an unfaithful servant. But at the end, the Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You uh, do what God gives you to. And then the parable of the pounds, authority, occupy until I come. And when I come, I'll give a reward. And so we are given things that we can do, amen? One of the greatest ministries at uh, uh, Three Mile Cross was the door ministry. 
And, and people thought, well, that's just a, a useless job, just someone standing at the door. No, it isn't. And I told the people on the door, I said, if you stand at the door, you are the first person everyone sees who comes into that church. And you can cheer someone, you can bless them, you can even get a word of knowledge and say, the Lord shows me you're down today, can I help you? Can I pray for you, amen? What a wonderful ministry. And I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to serve in the tents of wickedness. A doorkeeper, what a wonderful ministry. And I always told people in the church, I said, I'll never ask you to do anything that I'm not willing to do. And sometimes we clean the loos on the rotor because someone has to do it. And I'm sure you've heard of Tom Hamblin. Do you know Tom Hamblin? He used to take Bibles into Muslim countries. Brother Tom, he's not very well now, his memory's going. And he was Private Hamblin. And they stuck him on the latrines while he was in the forces. And the Major came to him afterwards. And he couldn't believe how well Tom Hamblin has cleaned those latrines. He said, what is going on? He said, I've never seen the latrines cleaned like this before anywhere. Do you know what Tom Hamblin said? He said, I did it for Jesus, sir. I did it for Jesus. What a wonderful testimony. And he rebuked an army chaplain for not preaching the truth, <laughs> which took a lot of courage. And he went into Muslim countries at great risk, never hiding the Bibles, got caught sometimes, preached to imams and all sorts. What a wonderful testimony. <coughs> so how we use our God-given abilities. Number four, I'll do these quickly. How... This is a hot potato. How we use our money. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Everyone will leave the building now. How we use our money. And, and, and the Bible says, it is the love of money that's the root of all evil, not money. When, when I was a teenager, God spoke to me. And, and I, I didn't have any theology on this. But he showed me Malachi 3, 16. Uh, uh, and he said, bring all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord, if I will not pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And so nobody told me, but I started tithing my money. Amen. I started giving a tenth of it. One day my dad found a little notebook and castigated me for giving money away. Don't know how he got hold of it, but, but it was a blessing to me. And, you know, people say, well, tithing is Old Testament. Well, it is Old Testament, but New Testament is more than a tithe. Because even in the Old Testament, if they tithed everything they should have done, they gave a third of everything. And grace demands more than law. So start somewhere, starting somewhere. And bless, and, and God will help you and bless you. And he met our needs. It was wonderful. So how we use our money. And 2 Corinthians... Uh, uh, chapter 9 verses 6 and 7 and I want to encourage you you know we, we've seen miracles on 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 finance every man as he purposes it in heart so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity for God loves a cheerful or hilaros in the Greek hilarious giver and I'll tell you that I can tell you story after story of people I had a friend who had a gift of giving wonderful gift of giving and in our, de in our church one day, uh, a man came in from Wales. He was unemployed and he desperately wanted to put some money into the offering, this man. And he didn't have the money to give in. And he said, Lord, please, couldn't you supply some money so that I can put it in the offering? He wanted to give. A lot of people who got it don't want to give. And a friend of mine had a gift of giving. And this man prayed, I think it was for £10. Without knowing any of this, my friend, who had a gift of giving, went up to him and be, 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 after the start of the service and before the offering, and he placed ten pounds in his hand. God spoke to him. Give, give this man. And, and it's joy. It's a joy to give. And I want to encourage you how we use our money, how we use our, uh, uh, the things that we, we have. And I tell you, you can't take it with you. And in our church, when we did, we wanted to get buildings or develop buildings and all that, we did all kinds of things. Went through our house, you know, go through your house, find out stuff you're not going to take with you. Might be something valuable. I noticed an auction room when I came in through Bourne. Do you ever watch the auction programmes on TV? And it doesn't take a lot. And I could tell you story after story of, of, of ways in which money was raised. What about a car boot sale and take some tracks out there? And as people come and buy the stuff on your car boot, you give them a track and say, Born Evangelical Church. Amen. 
Some of the stuff we sold, we got rid of even some stuff in the church, old church building and house. Some of it was, we made trips to Christie's and all those places. It was amazing what happened. I haven't got time to go into all that. How we use our money. I want to encourage you. Use your finance. How much you suffer for Jesus. That's another one. How much you suffer for Jesus. When men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil falsely against you. Great is your reward in heaven. We've had our fair share of that, I'll tell you. But you, have, you give it to the Lord and he'll reward you for it. How we spend our time, redeeming the time because the days are evil, Ephesians 5.16. Time. If we kill time, we injure eternity. If we kill time, we injure eternity. So how we use our time. And time is an important thing. And time is like a suitcase. Some people can get more in the suitcase than others. My wife's good at packing suitcases, I'm not. But let's use our time wisely, not wasting time, but redeeming the time because the days are evil. I've got 12 of these. Number seven, how we run that particular race which he has chosen for us. Do you know, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 says this, Don't you know that they which run in a race all run, but one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain. Now I love that. Because I was into running. I used to do cross country, sprinting. And I still think I can do it, but I probably can't. <laughs> and at the moment, my leg's a bit gammy because I was told not to do high kicks and vault disabled rails. And I didn't listen to the advice that was given. So you pay a price. But what I'm saying is, is that there is a race that we're all given. You've got a race. You've got a course. You've got good works that God has prepared. Ephesians 2 says that that we should walk in good works which he has before prepared in Christ that we should walk in them. So you've got to find out what they are. It's, it's a great challenge and a great privilege. And I found out what God wanted me to do and I did it. And I'll tell you, we've had a hard life but an exciting life. We've just completed 50 years of golden wedding. It seems to have gone just in five minutes. I don't understand where it all went. But some of the things that God has enabled us to see and to do and adventures we had with him, I wouldn't change it for all the world in China. Amen? Pardon? Tea in China. Tea in China. What did I say? Gold. Tea in China. Okay. So there's a race that God has for us. And let me tell you, people will try and knock you off the race. We went through, a, as you know, a difficult time five years ago. We kind of got a bit wheedled out from what we had built over 40 years. God gave me a dream. Let me share with you what the dream was. Do you, do you know God speaks through dreams? Not always. If you eat too many sausages, you speak through dreams. <laughs> and this was the dream. And I was on a running track. And there were people at the start and they were trying to elbow me off that running track. And I wasn't going to let them elbow me off. And so I decided to do what God had called me to do and I wasn't going to let them elbow me off. And the race started. We all started running and all the people who'd elbowed me off, uh, 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 they pushed to one side and I got on that track and ran for all I was worth. And that's how I used to do cross country, get out front and stay there. Didn't always work, but that's what I did. Get out there and stay there. And we got to the tape at the end of this race. And I looked across and I shouted out, who won the race? <laughs> and I heard a voice said, you did. <laughs> and it encouraged me because of what we'd gone through, because of the things that people have put us through. And that Nobody can put you off the race if you decide to do it with God. People will try and persecute you, push you off, stop you. But how you run the race that God has given. And all, every one of you here today has got a race that you can run. Make sure you run it. Don't get disqualified at the end. Okay, number eight. How effectively you control the old nature, 1 Corinthians 9. I'll try and do these quickly. It goes on to say, Every man that strives for the mastery is self-controlled in all things. I keep my body under and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. And your body is important. What you do with your appetites and desires is important. So important. 
how effectively you control the old nature. Two natures, two natures live within my breast. The one is foul, the other blessed. The one I love, the one I hate, the one I feed will dominate. So, how effectively we control the old nature. Number nine, how many souls we witness to and win to Christ. He that winneth souls is wise. And Paul said to one group of people, you are my crown and rejoicing. You say, well, I, I don't know how to win souls to Jesus Christ. Well, there's many ways you can do it. Many ways you can do it. What about getting some of Tony Pierce's second coming tracks? Keep them at your door. And when a workman comes around, say, have a read of this. You'd be shocked at how many people will take them. Or have stuff in your car. There's many ways. You might not feel particularly bold, but I could tell you story after story, divine encounters and appointments that God has. Our, what was that cooker went wrong this week? A microwave went wrong the other week. Oh dear Lord, not something else gone wrong. Not another thing. Took her an hour to get through to the people who were going to repair it. It was under warranty. Do you find that? Can't get through to anybody these days. Anyway, the, the microwave goes away. And then a few weeks later, it comes back. And someone phones up and said, I'm bringing the microwave. And a van arrives outside. He couldn't find the house, but I went out and I said, I'll come out. And a chap gets out of the van. And the chap who gets out of the van and he, say, he says, he says, it is you, I know you. Do you know who I am? And I looked at him. I said, you're Daniel. You're Daniel. You used to be a young person in the church, Daniel. And he said, yeah, he said, I saw your name. And he said, I looked at it and said, I thought it must be you. It must be you. And I brought the microwave back. And he ran up to Mary. He said, give me a hug. She came up to me, give me a hug. Give me a hug. How are you getting on, Daniel? Are you still going to church? No, he said, I'm a backslider. I'm a backslider. I said, well, Daniel, you've got to slide back. You've got to slide back to Jesus. Divine appointment. Gave him one of Tony Pierce's second coming leaflets. Amen. If you look for divine appointments, you'll get them. There's, there's all kinds of ways, all kinds of things. Look for it. We could preach for hours on that. How many souls? How we react to temptation or testing. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. So maybe you're tempted or tested. How you react to it makes a difference. 2 Timothy 4.8 Those who love his appearing. Those who love his appearing. Just two more and then we'll be done. 2 Timothy 4.8 2 Timothy 4.8 there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day and not to me only but to, unto all them that love my appearing. Do you love his appearing? Do we live as though if he were to come next week we would be ready? What would we change? Or would we be ashamed at his coming? How much the rapture means to us. Finally, how faithful are we? to the word of God and the flock of God. How faithful are we to the word of God? And to be faithful to the word of God is to be faithful to God's people, to be faithful to Jesus, to be faithful to the church, to get behind what God is doing. Amen. I wish I lived up here. I'll come and help you get the building straight. I'll pray in and God can do miracles. We've just been down in South Wales a few weeks back. Excuse me. That might be a sign from the Lord. <laughs> Do you know where we stood? In Rhys Howells Bible College, which has been restored by people from the far east. And Rhys Howells bought that college by faith. He did everything by faith. And when he bought the college, the, the Lord said to him, it's now or never. It's now or never. And he bought that college and God provided every penny. He had his battles. And then after he died, it got into decay and someone's come down and restored it and renewed it. And now it's a place of prayer and a Bible college. Uh, but faith, we have to exercise faith. God will always pay for what he orders. Amen. He'll pay for what he orders. God's no man's debtor. I can tell you that from many stories. God is no man's debtor. 
And so God has provided this church here. I want to challenge every one of you, get behind it. If you're watching in on Zoom, don't stay in your sealed houses, but get up and get out and work for the Lord is with you because the glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of the former. What a wonderful testimony. I'm sure Pastor Jason never ever thought that this building would come up even five years ago. What a miracle. And I can tell you there are people out there who would give their right arm, not literally, for a building like this. It's a wonderful, wonderful miracle. You are privileged. And I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to buy up every opportunity that you have. Think of all the things you can do with a building like this, to serve the gospel, not to control. Wonderful. Wonderful. Everything you ever wanted to do, you could do in these buildings. The only thing I'd move is probably the seats. <laughs> you know where they're called pew? <laughs> well, I'll leave you to guess. If you sit on them too long, what do you say? All right. So that's really what I want to share with you. I hope I haven't kept you too long. But I pray that I've challenged you today. Get behind. This is a wonderful opportunity that God has given unto you. And I pray that every one of us will be on fire for God. We'll take that opportunity. We'll see this house built. The glory of this house shall be greater the latter house than of the former. But the Lord says, work for I am with you. He needs workers. Carpenter from Nazareth requires joiners. And you and I can be the joiners. You don't have to be clever. You don't have to be talented particularly. You just have to be available. God is more interested in not your ability, but your availability. And then he'll show you what to do. So God bless you. Amen.